in any conflict. Your fate will depend on your actions. War crimes will be prosecuted. War criminals will be punished. And it will be no defense to say, I was just following orders. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the fourth session of the World Tribunal on Iraq. My name is Joel Covell, and I'll be moderating the afternoon's activities and also delivering a brief talk at the beginning of them. So I'd like to talk briefly about the question of infrastructure in Iraq. It's not an easy matter to sum up, but I think a moment's reflection will tell us that no advanced or modern society can proceed without a foundation in road, trans roads, transport systems, electricity, water, communication lines, etc. And no understanding of the circumstances of the invasion and occupation of Iraq can go forward unless we have in mind a fairly clear picture of what has happened to the infrastructure on block of this whole country. And that's impossible from two standpoints. One is it's a large country. It's roughly the size of the state of California. And the other is, of course, it's involved in ongoing destructive activities. Much of the country now is off limits. Nobody can go there. Nobody knows what's happening in Iraq. There was a brief window when activities could be taken to assess the infrastructure of the country as a whole, and that occurred after the phase of the U.S. invasion in March and April of 2003. And at that time, the country was uh, overrun by lots of people who wanted to study what was going on there and what, what they were left with, so to speak. There were really two kinds of groups doing that. The one kind which I think we would all feel very comfortable with, we could dispense with for the purposes of this discussion because these consisted of various peace groups, NGOs, religious groups, and so on, who wanted to make an assessment of the immediate damages of the invasion of Iraq. And uh, you can follow their reports on the internet and they uh, detail innumerable uh, homes, businesses, markets, et cetera, destroyed in the course of the attack by uh, artillery and munitions of one form or another with attendant human suffering. That was documented. However, the more germane and relevant point for, for us is the, uh, uh, the minions of the uh, successful invasion force um, who wanted to go over the country and make a survey of what had now fallen into their hands. Um, this consisted principally of uh, USAID, the Agency for International Development, working hand in glove with large corporations, in particular the Bechtel Corporation. Now, some of this is going to be picked up again tomorrow when I uh, resume the discussion on the ecological effects of the war. So we'll set aside some of the more uh, dubious uh, aspects of the contributions of Bechtel. But Bechtel and various U.S. agencies scoured the country and made various kinds of reports. You can tr track the results again on the, the web. They, they published a report in June 03. There are also various uh, United Nations uh, agencies who are doing the same. And in, the, in this course, they, they inspected the ports, they inspected the roads, they inspected the 
bridges, they inspected the oil facilities and the pipelines, they inspected the electrical grid and the water system, they inspected the waste disposal system, <clears throat> uh, both in, in, from the standpoint of sewage solid, and solid waste, and also the ways in which industrial waste were disposed of. They inspected telecommunication systems, they inspected airports, they inspected healthcare facilities, they inspected schools. Uh, uh, it's necessary once more to remind ourselves that all of this was once in excellent shape, uh, Iraq being the most uh, highly developed of all countries in the Middle East up until its uh, miseries uh, befell it. Um, the, we certainly far take too much time to detail the results of this, but I, I want to f mention perhaps the principal conclusion and then give a certain amount of supporting evidence from these inspection reports. Uh, the conclusion is that uh, almost all of these systems are functioning very poorly or scarcely at all. However, the most salient feature for us is that the breakdown consisted of a, a, a modest to relatively serious uh, effect of the bombing and the attacks in March and April overlaid on a much more pervasive uh, sort of malignant state of advanced collapse and decay of all of the infrastructural elements of Iraq, which went back to the 1991 war. And in this regard, it's really necessary uh, to think, therefore, of this uh, war as a single process, um, not just uh, politically speaking, but also from the standpoint of what it has done to the infrastructure of this uh, once proud and now ruined uh, country, a country that became so ruined that before the invasion, uh, its gross domestic uh, product had fallen by 75 percent over 1990 levels. Uh, 60 percent of the people in 2002 were fully dependent on food rations. Uh, Fifty percent were unemployed. Uh, the amount of water available, this is all before the invasion in March 03, had fallen by half. Infantile mortality, which was 56 to 1,000 per thousand in 1984, had risen to 131 per thousand by 1999. And of the various uh, systems, um, just a few facts, cold numbers sometimes give us the sense of these things. The electrical grid of Iraq, which had once produced 4,400 megawatts, was only capable of producing 204 megawatts. Uh, <clears throat> it was estimated that it would cost $12 billion to repair this. Although the large generators were all right, but what wasn't all right was all the connection material, all the, wi the wiring that had decayed, all that had fallen apart, the short circuits, things that hadn't been uh, picked up. Uh, most of the damage had come from poor maintenance in the intervening years, and most of the poor maintenance came from the uh, period of sanctions. The period of sanctions was not only uh, in terms of embargoing oil and, and, uh, and uh, the more obvious um, penalties that were exacted, but also consisted of the um, of forbidding maintenance, forbidding the importation of spare parts, for example, into the, into the country. And so uh, the maintenance became increasingly difficult and eventually, you know, just led to this terrible deterioration. Um, on top of which, of course, looting and vandalism then ensued after the uh, attack. Uh, the similar findings for water systems, motors, pumps, control systems, were all in terrible shape. Wastewater system was in dreadful shape. It either released sewage directly into the rivers or in numerous cases, uh, the pipes had run together and both had cracked simultaneously and so wastewater would run directly into the uh, pipes that were supposed to deliver uh, potable drinking water. One of the more grim statistics is that in 1990, the city of Baghdad possessed uh, 800 trucks for the removal of solid waste, 
we call garbage trucks in, back home. Uh, by the uh, beginning of, 19, of 2003, there were only 80 such trucks. In other words, a 90% reduction in their solid waste removal capabilities, and you can imagine the kind of garbage that piled up in that respect, and also all the consequences of that pileup. Um, hazardous waste was not re removed from petrochemical sites, allowed to undergo its various forms of uh, chemical deterioration. The port at Um Kassar, uh, the dredges had all failed and had silted up and was virtually unusable. The roads and, uh, the, roads and the rail systems and the bridges were a little damaged, actually, in the 1903 attacks, but there was major damage from, as I, again, from the ongoing corruption uh, and poor maintenance and so on and so forth. The telecommunications was in a state of collapse, but that was fairly easy to pick, put back together, and it's uh, one of the few bright lights, if we may use that expression. Um, I think it's important to indicate that uh, studies have shown that the United States certainly was conscious of this throughout the period of sanctions. Uh, studies in, published in the year 2001 uh, showed deliberate U.S. Uh, 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 awareness of the vulnerability of Iraq's particularly electrical system, uh, deliberate efforts to continue its sabotage. It was by no means uh, any kind of simple neglect. It was rather an active, although somewhat surreptitious, product of continued corruption. Um, it's also important to note, point out and indicate that the bombings, as we know, continued and, and indeed doubled in intensity uh, in, during the last six months of the so-called uh, sanctions period. Uh, in short, the entire the, the entire sanctions period must be seen, in my view, as an attempt to soften up the country for its uh, uh, takeover and its eventual occupation and exploitation by the forces of the United States and Great Britain. Um, <clears throat> one of the most uh, serious aspects is the situation of the hospitals in Iraq. Um, our own Dar Jamal, who has contributed already to this conference, and I'll talk about some of his other contributions tomorrow, has recently released a survey of uh, healthcare facilities in Iraq, which is really uh, blood curdling. It's, it's, it's very, very depressing to read. Um, even the proconsul Paul Bremer admits this is not, we did quote, not nearly enough to sustain uh, hospitals. Um, the, um, uh, of the international aid that was promised to Iraq after the invasion, of 18, uh, aid promised by Congress, rather, of $18.4 billion, only $600 million was actually uh, delivered, and virtually none of that went to the sustenance of the hospital or healthcare uh, system. Do you need anything that else to uh, uh, remind us of the continuity of the U.S. policy? You can just uh, read on the internet, you know, hospital bombings, and you'll come across one bombing that'll be from March or April 03, and then you'll come across another bombing that was in 1998. Uh, in 1998, the U.S. actually bombed hospitals. The BBC covered that. I'm not going to take up your time to read the report, but it was a horrific bombing of a, a hospital in Bag Baghdad. 25 people were killed. It destroyed, of course, the possibilities of that part of the Iraq um, healthcare system, and it was the work of President Clinton, widely considered, of course, to be the benign um, interlude between Bush one and Bush II. Um, uh, so, oh, and one final thing. Before uh, the resistance, Iraqi oil production had fa fallen fa by about 75 percent during the, um, during the uh, period of, of sanctions. And as you know, the United States, uh, waged the war, and in fact promised to wage the war successfully because they were going to pay for it with oil uh, revenues. Well, that's a, uh, something of a joke, is it not? Uh, 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 attacks on the oil facilities, which were already in pretty bad shape, uh, began in April of 2003, and there were no fewer than 123 such attacks in the period between then and September 
of 2004. So the entire policy of having the oil pay for the U.S. occupation proved to have been a fiasco. Uh, in conclusion, I would say that there are two, two lessons to be drawn from this. One is and that we must think of this as one continuous war with a preliminary phase leading up to the definitive invasion. Obviously, there are differences within the ruling elites at one point or another, but there are always differences in any ruling elite in any war. What must not be overlooked is that this was one continuous war and that you cannot separate out the period of sanctions or the first Iraq and, uh, war from the second Iraq war. There was, of course, this brief period after April 03 when the occupying forces had more or less their run of the country, and that leads to the second uh, remarkable conclusion, which is it's, it's, it is quite amazing that these folks, uh, Paul Wolfowitz, et cetera, would say that, that the Iraqis would welcome the United States with, with uh, open arms, would put rose petals in their path, and, and this would be a, a cakewalk because they'd be so relieved at having the dictator, Saddam Hussein, out of uh, commission, um, and never evidently considering uh, that these human beings had stored up uh, 13, 12, 12 years of <clears throat> bitter, hateful memories of what the superpower had done to them. And it tells us that I, I think that we need to use two dimensions of uh, evaluation here. One is the dimension of illegality, criminality, evil, and so forth. And the other is the dimension of stupidity. Uh, is not, they're not necessarily the same. An invader, occupier can be both evil and illegal and so on, but also extremely stupid. And the idea that after all this uh, period of, of, of systematic destruction of the country that there would be uh, a welcoming reaction on the part of the Iraqi people must stand as one of the more colossal uh, gaffes and blunders in modern history. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Thomas Fassi, and he's going to talk to us about the health effects of depleted uranium weapons in Iraq. Good morning. Uh, it's a high honor for me to speak before uh, the World Tribunal in Iraq. I thank the organizing committee for their invitation. And I also thank uh, Basuk Ertur for assisting me with the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, this morning I would like to dedicate my presentation to an Iraqi colleague, Dr. Alim Yaqub, uh, who died a year and a half ago. Uh, uranium is radioactive and it's a toxic heavy metal. Inside the body, uranium exists as uranal ions, and much of the toxicity of uranium is chemically mediated, in addition to the effects mediated by radiation. It is now clear that uranium has multiple toxicities. This slide summarizes some of the major toxicities of uranium. Uh, by, the, by the early uh, 1900s, it was clear that uh, uranium was a kidney toxin. And by the mid-1940s, uh, it was clear that uranium is a neurotoxin. By the early uh, 1970s, it, it was clear that uranium is a carcinogen. And that is based on mortality studies of uranium workers and on experiments with dogs and monkeys. Um, the first evidence that uranium binds to DNA was reported in 1949 and by the early 1990s, uranium was shown to be a mutagen. Also, in the early 1990s, uranium was shown to be a teratogen, that is, an inducer of birth defects. Uh, the toxic effects of uranium on the kidney and on the nervous system um, have a prompt onset and typically occur within days of exposure and radiation probably plays little or no role in mediating uh, 
these effects on the kidney and nervous system. In contrast, the carcinogenic effects of uranium have a delayed onset. And the teratogenic effects of uranium might be due to exposure of one parent prior to conception or to exposure of the mother to uranium early in pregnancy. Um, in the context of depleted uranium weapons, we're talking about uranium oxides. And by far, the most dangerous route of exposure to uranium oxides is the inhalational or respiratory route. Uh, absorption of uranium oxides through the gastrointestinal tract, through the skin, and through the conjunctiva is possible, but quite limited. Uh, following impact with hard targets, uh, uranium metal undergoes combustion, releasing large quantities of very small uranium oxide dust particles into the environment. These dust particles derived from depleted uranium weapons are drastically different from the natural uranium that's normally present in rocks and soil. Soil particles contain uranium at very low concentrations, typically less than five parts per million. And the particle size uh, of soil particles, the vast majority of soil particles, uh, is large and not respirable. In contrast, um, the uranium concentration in DU dust particles is extremely high, typically more than 500,000 uh, parts per million. And these are, most of these particles are of a very small size and they're respirable. So compared to the uranium naturally present in the environment, DU dust contains uranium that is vastly more bioavailable, that is more readily internalized. Now, uranium ions bind to DNA. They bind in the minor groove of DNA. And while bound to DNA, they're chemically reactive and can give rise to free radicals which may damage DNA and chemically mediated damage of this type may contribute to the ability of uranium to induce cancers and birth defects. In February of 1991, more than 300 tons, and possibly much, much more than 300 tons of depleted uranium weapons were used in the south of Iraq. After latent periods of five to six years, increases in childhood cancers and birth defects were documented in the Basra government. And the most recent data indicate a fourfold increase in pediatric malignancies and a sevenfold increase in congenital malformations compared to 1990, the year preceding the war. The epidemiologic data that I will present were, were reported by Dr. Alim Yakub and Dr. Uh, Janine Hassan. This first graph presents the changing incidence rates of congenital malformations among children at, born at the Women and Children's Hospital in Basra. In 1990, the incident rate for was approximately three cases of congenital malformations per 1,000 births. Uh, this rate fluctuated considerably until 1998 when it began to rise sharply. By 2001, the rate was more than 22 uh, cases per 100,000 births, more than a sevenfold increase compared to 1990. The next graph depicts the changing incidence rates of all childhood cancers and in, in red, and 
of leukemia, the most common childhood cancer in yellow in the Basra government. Now, the zero level on the ordinate represents the incident rate for 1990, the year before the war. The incident rates for childhood cancers and for leukemias rose significantly between 1995 and 1998, and then, be, then began to rise sharply in 1999, as you can see. So we can see that there was a striking increase in the number of leukemia cases in children younger than five. In 1990, two children, two children were diagnosed with leukemia under the age of five in 1990. And in 2002, 53 children were di uh, under the age of five were diagnosed with leukemia. When we look at charts and graphs of leukemia cases, we can easily lose sight of the anguish that leukemia represents for each child and his or her family. So I will close by presenting the story of Atarit, a five-year-old boy in Baghdad. The photo was taken in mid-March 2003, a few days before the bombing of Baghdad began. Uh, Atarit was in hospital for treatment of his leukemia and his mother, Adra, has just been notified that all cancer patients in the hospital will be sent home to make room for the expected casualties from the imminent bombing. At the end of March 2003, Atara died at home of septicemia, a blood infection. Uranium is a known carcinogen and a known inducer of birth defects. Consequently, its dispersal into the environment in a form that is so readily realized is at the very least profoundly reckless. Uh, thank you.